Hey everybody, Rob Maurer here, and today we're going to be talking a little bit about Tesla stock. We've obviously been in a bit of a lull here so far in 2021 in terms of the price action. And yesterday after market close, Morgan Stanley released a note talking about some paths forward for Tesla to kind of break out of that lull. So it brought some thoughts to mind for me. We'll go through that note and I'll share my thoughts as well. We also then have an updated note from Mizuho Securities, some pretty big news on Tesla Solar, and an update on Tesla's Giga Berlin approval status. Quick look at the markets today, the Nasdaq pretty much gave up its gains from yesterday, finishing down 7 tenths of a percent, and Tesla giving up more than that, so now moving down on the week, but finishing down 3% today to close below $600 at $599.36. Heads up for tomorrow, Tesla will likely be subject to the whims of the macro environment as the Federal Reserve wraps up a two-day meeting, Fed Chairman Jerome Powell will have a press briefing tomorrow, and the Fed will release their quarterly projections as usual, so the market is going to be looking closely at both of those things. I'm not sure exactly what time that is tomorrow, but something to keep an eye out for. Alright, we'll start off here with the Morgan Stanley note. They have maintained their price target, so $900 per share, maintained their overweight rating, and Adam Jonas has given us an update here on his five thoughts on the path forward for Tesla. I think there's some interesting insight here related to their conversations with institutional investors, which is something I'm always keeping an eye out for from analyst updates because we just don't really get much of that insight oftentimes. And I think it's pretty helpful for understanding a sentiment and how it is perceived right now and how it's evolving over time. So Jonas kicks off the note by saying, quote, Let's begin with a healthy dose of intellectual honesty on the starting point for the stock. In our opinion, even bulls should admit that the rise in the stock price during the second half of 2020, while perhaps deserved in principle, was packed into a highly concentrated time frame. Combine that with the institutional inertial forces accompanying the S&P 500 inclusion, and the recipe was, in hindsight, a classic blow off the top. The stock had the better part of five years worth of performance packed into about five months. Nearly halfway through the year and the shares have significantly underperformed both the broader market as well as broader technology and automotive peers." End quote. So I would pretty much agree with that. I think there's not much in there that you could really disagree with. Obviously we saw a huge run in Tesla stock. That can't persist forever unfortunately. There's always going to be periods of time where the stock isn't really doing much. I talked about this, I don't know, a couple weeks back giving the example of some shares I bought in 2013 being worth less in 2019 six years later. Now, of course, today they're worth significantly more, and in hindsight, they should have been worth more in 2019 than they were, but that's just how the markets work sometimes. That's why I'm a long-term investor, and that's where the old adage of time in the market is more important than timing the market. Would selling Tesla at $800 a share, putting that investment money somewhere else for a year, and then coming back into Tesla proven to have been a good strategy? Well, probably, but for every person that did that, there's probably two, three, four, five, ten, I don't know, way more people that sold on the way up when Tesla was setting pre-split highs of $1,200, $1,500, $1,800, prices that now post-split are far lower than any of the lows that we have seen so far this year. That's why for me, I primarily anchor on that long-term belief that Tesla is going to be a multi-trillion dollar company. I invest around that thesis, and then I don't have to worry too much about how things are going in 2021 or 2022. For me, those things just don't really matter too much. I'm really just looking for Tesla to continue to make progress towards that multi-trillion dollar outlook. All that being said, understanding the short-term things can help build confidence in the thesis, it can also create some opportunities, and clearly so far this year, Tesla from a stock perspective has been in a bit of a lull. So that's sort of what Jonas is assessing here, saying, okay, what are the paths forward? He does note that, quote, over the past couple of months, incoming client interest on Tesla is focused mostly on Chinese sales slash production data and Elon Musk's tweets regarding Bitcoin, end quote. So that's kind of an interesting contrast between what we heard from Alex Potter at Piper Sandler, where Alex had said he wasn't really getting any calls about Tesla's Bitcoin investment, but Elon has continued to tweet. A lot has changed since then, so I don't know if things have changed there at Piper Sandler. And I continue to believe that all of that hasn't really had much of an impact on Tesla stock. I showed some data supporting that before, but this is a little bit of a counterpoint to my thoughts there. Anyway, if you want to distill those things down to paths forward for Tesla stock, then really strong data coming out of China seems to be one of those paths and maybe Elon talking a little bit less about Bitcoin, but I don't really agree with that one, and I think the market eventually becomes numb to that either way, so even if institutional investors are asking about it, it doesn't necessarily mean that's making a difference. They could also be asking from a Bitcoin perspective rather than a Tesla perspective. Jonas does note that the overall attention given to the whole Tesla-Bitcoin situation is emblematic of a little bit of that lull factor so far this year for Tesla. The thing I would add to that that Jonas doesn't explicitly mention but that I do think is having an impact is just the consistent and continual delays around FSD beta and Elon Musk's timeframes there. I think that has degraded a lot of the credibility that Tesla and Elon Musk had built up over the last couple of years, specifically with the early launch of the Model Y and the success starting Gigafactory Shanghai. 
Tesla for a good period there was kind of consistently laying positive surprise on top of positive surprise. And when that happens, that behavior gets projected forward. And we really haven't seen as much of that this year. It's not really a knock on Tesla. Obviously, they're still making tremendous progress, but setting aside probably Shanghai Model Y, which I think has been phenomenal, we're just coming off this pretty significant delay on the refresh Model S and X. We've got a lot of uncertainty remaining around the 4680 timeline. Berlin continues to be a question mark with all the bureaucracy there. Texas seems to be going fairly well, but again, some uncertainty, and if you're not following it super closely, it'd be fair to wonder about the progress, especially given some of these other things. Then of course, on top of all those other things, you've got the rotation out of growth stocks, you've got these other macro challenges like the semiconductor shortages, supply chain challenges, that can lead to logistics challenges, high raw materials prices, pretty decent amount of headwinds. So even with the rosiest of glasses, at minimum this has been more of a mixed bag situation for Tesla so far this year than what we saw last year, for example. Anyway, aside from China and Bitcoin, as I mentioned, Jonas here is presenting, quote, a few thoughts about what we believe can compete for investor attention on the Tesla story from here through year end, most of which are non-China developments, end quote. And he kicks the list of five off with number one, capacity expansion primarily outside of China. This I would agree with, as I mentioned, Giga Texas, Giga Berlin, sort of big question marks right now, and both kind of house the larger question of 4680 battery production as well. Under this point, Jonas does also note that it's really difficult to have high operating margins manufacturing in California. Tesla so far has been able to do that. So when Giga Texas comes online, when Berlin comes online, Jonas thinks those will help better demonstrate Tesla's operating leverage, which I fully agree with. I continue to believe that's extremely undervalued, underappreciated. Even before Berlin and Texas, I think Shanghai continues to be underappreciated from that aspect. That's been hidden or diminished to some extent so far as production has ramped up, a few other factors as well. And I think that starts to become a lot more clear in Q2, but especially as we head into Q3. So I would agree, capacity expansion and a sub point there on operating margins, I think huge, huge factors for Tesla the rest of the year. His second point here is new model expansion beyond SX3 and Y, noting the Cybertruck, a more compact vehicle, potentially a multi-purpose vehicle. I don't expect much on that front this year, except for obviously potentially the Cybertruck stuff, though I've said I think that is a little bit delayed. But what I particularly found interesting about this section was Jonas writing, quote, our discussions with investors reveal a bit of a blind spot on the potential segment expansion, end quote. I think that's one of the biggest head scratchers for Tesla bulls of like, how do you not see where this is heading? But that should represent significant remaining upside in the stock then. And also it shouldn't be too surprising given the fact that the current analyst consensus estimate for 2025 is something like 2.3 million deliveries. So I don't really agree with the new model expansion as a catalyst for this year particularly, but I did find that sub point interesting. Point three here, battery manufacturing expansion slash including third-party supply to other OEMs. So I've shared my thoughts on this plenty before. I am not a buyer of this idea. Licensing, sure. Supplying motors, maybe. Supplying batteries, I'm completely out on that idea. Yes, Elon Musk did say last year that they would be open to it, but he should say that. But as I said at the time, that's a good stance for Tesla to maintain publicly. And of course, you would never want to completely rule out something without first considering it. But Tesla is battery constrained. Two months after tweeting this, Elon also tweeted, quote, We intend to increase, not reduce battery cell purchases from Panasonic, LG, and CATL, possibly other partners too. However, even with our cell suppliers going at maximum speed, we still foresee significant shortages in 2022 and beyond, unless we also take action ourselves, end quote. Does that sound like a company that's ready to start giving away their batteries to other companies? <laughs> Definitely not to me. Maybe that can change in two or three years when 4680 volume production is really ramped up, but there's just no way I can see that as a catalyst for this year. Point four is expansion of service offerings to a broader range of its vehicles, including via subscription. Jonas writes, quote, Admittedly, we anticipated significantly greater levels of development and announcements around Tesla's software as a service type commercial offering than we have seen year to date, end quote. I'll also lump point five into my comments on this. Point five is just insurance. As we had talked about a week or maybe two weeks ago with that Reddit post that seemed to have some insight on the development of both subscription and the insurance product, it seems like there has been some good progress there. I think with the FSD subscription, Tesla's probably got that all ready to go technically. They're probably just waiting for the best time to release that in terms of the financials and how it fits with the shift over to pure Tesla vision, removing radar, and the FSD beta expansion. I think they're just trying to balance those things out. I do think that has potential to be transformative in how Tesla's business model is viewed, but as Zach noted in the last conference call, there is a little bit of a trade-off because that's less upfront revenue, less upfront gross profit for Tesla. So while the market tends to love high margin software as a service subscriptions, which of course it should, it might take some time for that to get sorted out in the financials and for the impact to be fully understood. 
As for insurance, I don't really see that as a catalyst for this year. I think long term, I am excited about the prospects that Tesla has in that space and the ability to lower the total cost of ownership and more importantly, cost effectively insure a Tesla network ride sharing fleet in the future. So I'm not trying to diminish that. I just don't see it as a big factor for the financials or the stock this year. So those are the factors for Tesla stock discussed by Morgan Stanley. I would most strongly agree with the importance this year of China numbers, the capacity expansion mentioned, and of course, my favorite, the demonstration of operating leverage. I would not agree on Bitcoin, new model expansion with the exception of Cybertruck Progress, or Tesla as a battery supplier, and I'd be a little bit in the middle on FST subscription and insurance. In addition to those items that I agree with, I would just again highlight the importance of earning back that credibility, which is done by hitting disclosed timelines for FSD, hitting timelines on Giga Berlin and Texas, of course 4680 battery production, and Cybertruck. Unfortunately, I don't have a ton of confidence that Tesla's going to be able to meet or exceed those timelines on any of those, which is okay with me because I understand that Tesla's timelines are aggressive, and that might actually result in the most progress over time, but aggressive timelines are not how you win the psychological battlefield that is the stock market. Again, as a long-term investor, that is something that I'm okay with. I would not want Tesla optimizing for anything other than the best and fastest long-term progress. All right, I spent more time on that than I expected to, so let's move on here. We do have an updated note here quickly from Mizuho. Remember, they're relatively new to covering Tesla, just picking up coverage this year. Today, they have reiterated their buy rating on Tesla and their $820 base case price target. I wanted to at least mention it because I saw a couple headlines on it today, but from the media reports that I've seen so far, there doesn't seem to be too much new information in the note. Just a couple of things on market share. Long term, they continue to expect Tesla to get a 10% market share in the total automotive market. All right, next here is some pretty big news on Tesla Solar. I saw this pointed out on Twitter today by Tesla owner Silicon Valley. It looks like Tesla's got a new 10-year, 1% APR financing offer for Tesla Solar. Those terms seem to be available with a 10% down payment, so with a couple thousand dollar down payment, you could get a $20,000 system for about $150 a month, and that's before factoring in federal incentives. It looks like Tesla's offering this financing rate on both the rooftop solar as well as solar roof, and as we know, Tesla is now requiring power walls to be bundled in with any solar product, so those would fall in with this financing as well. So this definitely improves the affordability of Tesla's energy products, but obviously there is a cost to offering such low financing rates. That's well below inflation. Time value of money is a very real thing, so I am not sure exactly how Tesla would be able to offer this. Obviously, they're probably working with a financing partner on this, and there must be some reason that that partner would want to offer these low rates. So I don't know that we'll figure out that reason. Certainly, financing like this is not unprecedented, especially in the solar power space, where a huge part of adoption is bringing that actual cost down to parity with current utility costs, and long-term financing can definitely do that. It's just not an area of business that I happen to know a lot about already, so if you have some insight on that, definitely feel free to share in the comments today. All right, lastly here is an update on the application approval status for Giga Berlin. As we have talked about, Tesla has resubmitted their application to include battery manufacturing plans. And unfortunately, Brandenburg has decided that because of that, the application will need to go through a new public participation process, as we mentioned as being a possibility. So apparently that will begin this Friday on June 18th and run for one month until August 16th. And then quote, after the end of the objection period, the approval authority decides whether a new discussion of the objections raised is necessary." End quote. So not terribly surprising. I don't know why it needs to be one month long. Certainly seems like a week or two would suffice. I'm sure that timeline was what was expected, but that is new and disappointing to me. As a small consolation, we should get some new documents here as a part of this public participation process. So maybe we'll see some new interesting details in that. That is where we'll leave it for today, though. As always, thank you for listening. Make sure you're subscribed and signed up for notifications. You can also find me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast, and I'll see you tomorrow for the Wednesday, June 16th episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.